First off, Scotty alluded to it. Uh, thanks for being here. It's Friday night. There's lots of other things to do. Um, I think the whole football fraternity gets better as we all learn together. It doesn't matter if we compete against each other as long as we're always making the game better. Um, as someone who's had the opportunity to coach elite players that come through the high school system, I love it that the players are well coached. As, as a Rams coach, the better coach they are coming up, Scotty would say the same thing, the better coach they are coming up, the easier the job is for us to compete in the games that we are. Um, <clears throat> thanks to Scotty and Dave for uh, putting these on. This is a great idea. This is unbelievable. It takes a lot of work. It's a lot of thankless work. I know it doesn't seem, you know, we're sitting in a room and all that kind of stuff. There's technologies, organizing speakers, all that kind of stuff. So I really appreciate you guys doing what you do. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into a super long introduction, but I actually think it's important to understand um, who you're listening to if you don't know who I am. And so there's a few new faces in the crowd. So like to spend a few minutes. Um, I'm a long-term coach. I, I coached RMF for seven years. I got to be a head coach for six, six of those seven. I got to coach in high school, thanks to Coach Hall, to uh, Campbell for three years, and we had a lot of great success. Uh, also, thanks to Coach Hall, I got to coach U16 for four years as a head coach for three, offensive coordinator for three, overlapped for two of those years. And we won two goals during that time. I coached U17. Got to coach at at and Stadium at U17. Got to coach U18 for four years. Two times, two years as a special teams player, we won silver. Last two years uh, as the head coach, when we were successful, we won gold. And now, most recently, I am now uh, with the Rams going on to my fourth season as a special teams coach, uh, also coaching some receivers. So I have this sort of football in my DNA, uh, but I'm also, I also have a job. Uh, thing doesn't pay the super well. And uh, <laughs> job and CEO of uh, ISC. And ISC is a 400 person company, global now. We have people in Ireland and Vernon and Toronto and Montreal, uh, across Saskatchewan. And so busy with that. Uh, Scotty alluded to him, uh, being the president of RMF. I had nine years on the Saskatchewan Rough Rider uh, Board of Directors, three years on the CFL Board of Governors. I try to meld this sort of football and business world together. And what I learn on the football field, I apply in the boardroom. What I learn in the corporate world, I, I apply. I apply to the. Uh, uh, I apply. I try to apply to the football field. So there's a lot of uh, cross learning, if you will, and uh, I think it's it's kind of important. So uh, I'm going to do two talks today. So I'm going to ramble through some uh, leadership stuff. We're going to stand up, take a break, and then talk a little bit of punt returns. We've got to talk actually and uh, clearly that's hard to do with leadership. Um, the first half of the talk is about leading a new generation. And I do a lot of public speaking and a lot of thought about leading multi-generational workforces. Silent generation boomers mashed up with Gen Xers who are mashed up with millennials, and you can just imagine the chaos that ensues. Well, we as football coaches now are coaching the next generation. <coughs> generation Z, Generation Z, um, whatever label you want on it. This isn't a talk about the differentiation of the generations. We certainly could do that. But it's important. And it's important to be able to relate to that generation in a football context. Because football, as a coach, <coughs> is all about preparation and motivation. We gotta pair of players, and we've got to get them motivated. No presentation is good without a quote, but this, what, this quote actually matters to me. Uh, George Orwell quote. And it really, it's been a pet peeve of mine, and it especially is a pet peeve of mine in football. I'm a Gen Xer. A lot of you are Gen Xers too. There's some millennials in the crowd, but a lot of Gen Xers, a few boomers as well. But Every generation thinks they're smarter than the previous and wiser than the next. I know as a Gen Xer, absolutely true. We are way smarter than baby boomers. And we're, I can assure you, we're wiser than millennials. But what's interesting about that is it doesn't make sense because 
Jenna, our baby boomers would say the same thing. They'd say they're smarter than the silent generation and a hell of a lot wiser than the next one, than the Gen Xers. And I'm telling you, the millennials are saying the same thing and Gen Zers are saying the same thing. And that's interesting to me. It's interesting to me because football is so tradition-based. It's so, this is the way it has to be. And if I listen to my grandpa, you know, if I can hear the voice of my grandpa say, no, no, that, you don't carry around a phone. You don't do that. You're this, you're that. This judgment about a generation. Well, we as football coaches is how. It, there isn't a coach that I haven't been around that has said words like this. Kids these days or players these days. It happens every day. Players these days, man. I don't know what the words are. Lazy? Don't care. Don't care. Don't care. Players don't care. <laughs> Players today don't care. They're lazy. Have you listened to the music? <laughs> Seriously, have you listened to the music? You ever got Young Thug playing? Jay Z, Drake, Lil Wayne? Doesn't make sense. Like the best music is the tragically hit. <laughs> like we know that. Pioneer might say the best music's Elvis. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Players today don't have commitment. Players today need to be in charge. Whether they know anything or not, they need to be in charge. You are coaching, if you're coaching offense, if you have 20 players on offense, 11 of them think they're the offense before game. Because they can call plays better than you can. They can design plays better than you. I'll tell you a story. This generation grew up knowing and doing things we never did. My boys were 20, turning 22, turning 20, both football players. They planned a damn family vacation where Cheryl and I gave them a magazine and said, you have X to spend, figure out where we're going. Don't tell me when those two players go into a coach's room. Coach McCarthy has to deal with Coach Rumble has to deal with the other one. They need their opinion heard. They're used to making decisions. They're in charge. Players today don't respect authority like a previous generation does. They don't have an attention span. We all know that. Anyone who's a teacher in the room knows that. And they want to be individuals. So many of us so many of us at every level, I don't care if it's the Bombers, I'm sure Coach Hall has to deal with this, Coach McCauley has to deal with this, Coach McConkey has to deal with this, I'm sure Coach Hall has to deal with this, on the Victorias, players want their damn shirts untucked. <laughs> they want that stuff hanging out. They want to have sleeves or they don't want to have sleeves. I tell you, if they remove the visor restriction, Half of your team would have tinted visors. Part of the reason is they want to be individuals. <clears throat> they want to buy into your system as themselves. And there's a whole bunch of you doing this right now. No way, Jeff. Not letting them untuck. No way. That's not who we are. And I'm not saying you should. You do what you do. Just have to think about it. The question that I have and I think about when I think about teams is why do I bother? Why do we bother? If all of these things that are anti-football to us, if any of you played football, there is no head coach that said these are an acceptable list of characteristics or attributes for you guys to have. We spend lots of time trying to get rid of these. But this is what this generation is. And the question is, why do we bother? <clears throat> why we bother is because that's who we got. We don't have a choice. There's not a free agent generation out there. There's not like, you know what, I'm just going to get a bunch of baby boomers that fit this age category. And by the way, I can't have any of this, so therefore I'm going to field 
the team, walk around my high school and find dudes and gals that don't do this. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. And I think that's a challenge. That's a challenge in the workforce. It's a challenge in the workforce for us at ISC because we're. it's hard to hire millennials. Man, it's hard to hire millennials. I meet millennials and they are in my office on a walk around. How long till I get to be the CEO? <laughs> uh, dude, you're 22. Like, I, I, I know I look young and old, but I've grinded a long time to get here. And so, <clears throat> the Rams coaches, uh, we were down, we saw two clinics this year, one in uh, Glacier Clinic and the other, the Night Coach of the Year Clinic, and E.J. Fleck was a talk, a speaker at the Night Clinic, and he is fantastic. If you get a chance, look up uh, his talk on culture. Uh, from the AFCA conference, um, but it was very similar to what happened at the night conference. And he talked about leading with culture. <coughs> leading with culture. And his message is about trying to meet players. He didn't use the word halfway, but meet players. So I, I have this, like, this metaphor that I have a house, I'm a coach, here's my rules, this is the way my house works. Fit in or get up. Pretty simple stuff. Fit in or get up. This is how. These are the rules that you have to play to play in my house. The reality is, those players, those kids, are in their house. And if we have this hard and fast deal that it's going to be this or going to be that or else they, it ain't going to happen, we aren't going to play football anymore. And we have to find a way to meet our players. I'm not saying halfway. I'm saying part of the way. Let's meet our players. Let's figure out a way to play in the front yard, which is close to our house, but it isn't exactly our house. It isn't exactly our house. P.J. Flack talks about music. He says, I don't like the damn music. You think I like listening to that shit? I don't. I hate it. But I have to listen to it because I want to meet my players part way. I got to try. And at the same time, I'm going to try to influence them with some of my music. You know, meet them part of the way. He talked about family. We all talk about families. Hey, this football's a family. Football's a family. And he realized he's the head coach of Minnesota. Took over a terrible program three years ago. And the guys that were in his program, he realized, have a non-traditional view of family. You say, this is fa hey, it's family. That dude came from a family where dad killed his mom. Family ain't cool to be around for those, some of those dudes. And he had to find a way. So he had an acronym. Forget about me, I love you. That's family. When he says family, it means that. And the challenge for us as football coaches is to find ways. One of the ways he does is through music. He works out with them. He does different things with them to meet them halfway. And he has some things that are so important to him that he can't let it go. You don't put the ball on the ground. You hand it back to the official. That's one of his non-negotiables. The ball is the program. Lots to learn there, and I think there's something to digest. Uh, for me, I think about this from a messaging standpoint. I'm trying to get across to a group of employees, trying to get across to a group of 18 to 24-year-olds who have the mentality of a four-year-old sometimes, I'm trying to get a message across to 17-year-olds that I'm taking halfway across the country. It's through messaging. And so <clears throat> the primary message of the talk is be conscious of your message. Be planned about your message. You as a coach should never, ever be off the cuff. It may feel off the cuff. It may present as off the cuff. But it's planned, deliberate, and intentional. And you need a plan and a, and a sense of intent <coughs> with 
all of your messaging. So as I think about the season, I don't care if you're a receiver coach, a head coach, a, a coordinator, a kicker coach. I think about the season and the multiple times I'm going to talk to my players. And I put a plan together for the season. What is my messaging? Not what's my speech. What's my message going to be? Make sure what you do around messaging builds upon itself. That it's connected. That it's consistent. Don't talk about being professional and well-mannered and say, you dumb shits. It's, that's an inconsistent message. Right? Be consistent in your message. Make sure what you say equals what you do. There is nothing that this generation sees through faster than that. Don't say, we need to be disciplined. You need to be committed. Watch me eat seven Big Macs. <laughs> you can't. It's misaligned. It's misaligned.
the character grows in our team. There is nothing magical about this list. It was my list, um, but that's what we used. And that's what we used with the Rams. That's what we used with the uh, U18ers. <coughs> and
40 players right there played the best football game they've ever played in the best venue event they've ever played in. We had to get rushed to the locker. They had to get tape off and kind of get undressed. Then we've got to get in to the buses and get back to the dorm. Part of the routine because we we got a game in two days. We got to get back. The boys got to get rested. We got to coach has got to stay up all night, break down film, all that stuff. So we're loaded on this damn school bus, and the players are happy, and I'm happy. Coach Mace, our OC, says, I'll just check the dressing room, make sure nothing's in it. And he took a picture. And that was our dressing room after we're done. You gotta imagine 40 football players taking off tape, black pellets everywhere, garbage everywhere. There isn't a speck of it in here. Nobody told the players to clean up. Nobody said a word. No coach said, hey, make sure our stuff's taken care of. It was, hey, let's get on the bus. And this is how they left it. We then go out and play Quebec. Quebec is a nemesis, an arch rival, if you will, of Saskia. We played them in the gold medal a lot. Uh, we lost a couple of years, or three or four or three years ago, in a game we should never have lost, one of them. Uh, we played them. <coughs> They got players. They're better than us. Their DN is 285 pounds. Our tackle is probably 205. Like it, it, it's not going to be fair. And we go up and win, 16-9. You know, great game, great game. So I love this picture where Queen's University scores up there. I know the insulation's not great. Um, players have their gold medals on, and I'm talking about how when you commit to something, you get the reward, and this is the reward, and it's. You know, generally all eyes are up on, which is rare. Um, that's awesome. Same thing, then the media and the sharks of the recruits and all that stuff happens and it's crazy and we gotta get out of here, guys, because we gotta get back to the door. We got a 3 a.m. departure back home and we gotta get rolling back into the dressing room. And at this point, this team has nothing to give me anymore. We've achieved our goal. We just gotta get home. I, I, happy to get the players on the plane. That's all I'm worried about at this point. And I don't know what kind of gong show this is going to be. Same thing, into the dressing room, get on the dress, get gear down, here we go, back on the buses. Coach Mace says, i got to go take a picture to make sure, I mean, i got to go see, and he takes a picture of our dressing room. Again, no players said anything, no coach said, you got to do this, we just did. And it, I share the story because the importance of the message is a way to meet our players halfway. We let them be individuals. We let them have fun. They probably felt they had more fun that week than they've ever had. They didn't, you know, and yeah, I didn't let them on top of their jersey. <laughs> Not that cool. Um, <laughs> And a punt team. Punt return team. Okay, now I know a lot of you aren't special teams folks, so the beer is not out, so you can't have one. Um, one of the things I, and this is just a piece of gray hair wisdom, um, I don't care what level you've coached at, how many years you've coached, there is things to learn from everybody. Whether it's speaking style or, huh, I, can, I think I can apply that. It just takes some active energy and active learning, active thinking to take what someone is doing and saying, I think I could apply that. So I challenge you, if you don't have special team responsibility, maybe you can help your special teams coach, or maybe there's something you can apply. Um, <clears throat> so last year, just for, again, for context, uh, last year I did the punt return team and the kick return team uh, for the Rams. So I do have some credentials, I guess, as, as, as it relates to what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, this, Pyramid is a little difficult to see, but 
uh, I stole it from a UNLV special teams coach. And he said, every single special teams needs to build on this pyramid. It starts with what are we intending? What do we intend to do with this team? And then we've got to have attitude and fanatical effort. Our job as coaches and as players is to make sure we're aligned and assigned properly, that our players have the right fundamentals and techniques. We then layer on the scheme, then we execute, and finish, finish, finish. Okay? Every team has to have this pyramid. What are we intending? Up through finish. So, tonight I'm going to touch on a few of these. One is, what are we intending? Our theme, our mentality, our approach. What are we trying to get done with our punt return team? I'm going to talk a little bit about personnel, because I think it applies to most of our coaches' situation. Talk a little bit about scheme, and a little bit about execution, and then we're going to try to flip into a few clips um, as well. Uh, I have the good fortune of every time we practice a team on the field, I get to meet the team early. Like so in the afternoon at 5 o'clock or at 6 o'clock, I get the punt return team, I get to talk to them before we get on the field. So I get to talk about what we're going to cover, what we're going to install on, in, the field, uh, in the meeting room before. Point is, this slide right here, this specific slide, I put up every single time we talk about punt return team. Every time. No exceptions. Because it sends the intent. The intent is, yes, it's punt return team time. It's time for us to attack. It's time for us to use our best weapon. And I just remind them, every damn meeting. Everyone, no exception, not one exception. Do we talk about punt return where this slide is not up at least once? <clears throat> so quickly, into personnel. As a punt return team, I think a lot of things. One of them, at a high level, you've got to know your opponent's personnel for punt. You've got to know if he has a punter coming in. You've got to know if that up back is the backup quarterback. You've got to know when they bring their long snapper in. If, he, if he's, okay, he's number 28 from the Huskies, ah, he's not on offense, here comes the long snapper. Right, you've got to know that stuff about your opponent. <clears throat> I also think your defense needs to know your punt return <clears throat> concepts. Because in today's game, especially at a lower level, but even increasingly at a higher level, the propensity to not know if you're going punt return or not, or just defense, forces you, from a safety standpoint, to leave your defense on the field. Because punt return is our weapon, I don't like giving up. I don't want to say, shit, they didn't, ah, we got caught, we didn't get our guys changed, ah, just do something safe. I hate that. Because if you get eight punt return opportunities, that's eight chances to swing the game. If you give one away, wasted. In a season of eight games, you only got 56 or 64 of those opportunities. I hate wasting them. <clears throat> These are just fundamental uh, sort of principles for me, my personnel. I also like to limit my changes. I get you're trying to get players on the field and all that kind of stuff, and that's important, but I hate multiple changes because two things, you get your best players off the field, and second, you don't know if you've got enough freaking guys on the field. There's a big bulk of group guys going in, going out. And as a special teams coordinator, the thing I hate the most about being a special teams coordinator is counting. I hate it. I have nightmares over it. I have nightmares. Ah, we got 13 coaches. I'm so sorry. Um, so I limit it. So in our scheme, in Coach Gray's scheme, we, have a, we run a three-man front. So the three big dudes, when we, when we know it's a punt, our three, three big dudes come off, put three other guys on, one of which is a returner, and that's it. If given a choice, I like speed over size. We play a Canadian game, speed matters. 
If I have a choice between a 220 pound slower guy or a 180 pound wiry fast tough guy, I'll take the 180 pounder and put a turn. This is not a passive team, it's an aggressive team. Cannot have any one of the 12 on that team, if you want it to be a weapon, to be a passive, mental, slow, methodical player. This is just a game. Let's go. We've got to make some plays. Scheme. <clears throat> we used to love watching Coach Jackson on the side of the field. They able to tell you stories. Dave says the same damn thing every time on the side of the field. When it's kick off. You say what? When you're be on side. Be on side. <laughs> well, if you watch me, I say the same damn thing when the punt return team's on. Know your eligibles. Know your eligibles. As it relates to scheme, simple's better than complex. We're smart. We're so freaking smart as coaches. Man, we're smart. We're smarter than everybody, and we're so smart, we have this complexity, and we just took football away from 12 players that can play. Simple is better than complex. And then as a coach, you need to decide how much freedom you're going to give your players and how much restriction you're going to give your players. And if I was a professor for a final exam, the hint is the more freedom you can give, the better. The more freedom you can give to let the player be an athlete, the better his chance to succeed is. If you restrict him or her, give less chance. I drew up four punt returns just because I feel like if you wanted to draw something, it's up. You're also welcome to these slides. <clears throat> and I'm not going to go through these in great, great detail, but here are four returns, punt return situations that we ran at U Sports level in 2019. One is an inside twins pressure where our will and our nose and our Sam and our tackle are shoulder to shoulder over the guard's nose and on go we attack and we force the guard to pick one of us, the other guy's going. We also bring the Mac because usually the snapper's got his head down focused on snapping, we go by and we're at least going to have three guys coming through the middle. Well, the corners who have this eligible responsibility, the outside up back, I've drawn it two double tights and two by two up backs, will also attack. We might get a guy free. Pretty simple concept, inside twins. Um, I share this with you, and I never ran it after game two. <laughs> so. Field wall. Field wall. Just a, a wall concept. You can draw better walls than I can. I give it to you only for completion purposes, because I never ran it once. Because I decided our intent on punt return team is to block the damn punt full stop. If you are coaching something other than the Bombers, who still, you know, at the CFL or American uh, professional level, still have errors, the act of snapping a football 15 yards perfectly to a punter who catches it perfectly and takes his two steps and gets it off quickly, the odds of that being successful all the time versus a guy running three in three seconds covering 15 yards. Almost every single person can run 15 yards in, or 12 yards, their hand up, make a block. Not everyone can snap the ball, not everyone can punt it, and we don't have the reps to do this enough. So I said, screw the wall, but it's there. Everyone needs a man concept. You're not sure what's happening, everybody has a guy. Every gal has a guy. I'm not going to do the gender transition now. Um, every person has a person, how about that? Um, you know who your person is, if they're an up back, you attack them and you block them to the field or the boundary, doesn't matter, you decide as a coach, and that's all it is, nothing fancy here. This play right here, which we called Swarm, I've got to change it now, but what we call Swarm is a simple a punt return team that I eventually, the Greenock guys, asked for the punt return team, so I 
gave them this, and then they blocked three punts in the next two games. Very simple. It's a man concept. Everybody has a man. The five inside guys, the Will knows, Mac, Tackle and Sam, These five guys are the eligible, are ineligible, so we don't care. We're going by them. And if your guy's an up back, you're going by, you're going attacking him. This pressure concept, well, puts pressure on the team. And what it does is, and we have simple rules. The simple rule is these five dudes who have these five guys. You don't care about them because they're not eligible. We're going by them. I give them full license to line up wherever they want. Wherever they want. If they want to put three guys out here or three guys out here or they want to stack, they want to put three guys in this A gap because they're athletes, they've been watching, they know I can beat that guy. Give them the license. This is what I was talking about. Keep it simple. Let your athletes be athletes. These five guys can go anywhere they want. The only rule is one of them has to be here. Just one. And I just don't want it consistent. Because this is dangerous. But I like dangerous. I want some team to have the courage to say, you know what, I know they're bringing it and we're going to fake it. Hey, coach, I think we can beat these guys on a fake. Oh, really? Wayne Harris? Yeah, sure. No. We're going to punt. Thank you very much. I love that kind of stuff. So we ran this after week three exclusively. At the CIS level, U Sports level, we ran the same punt return team for five games in a row. Kind of embarrassing. Should get a, pay, should get a pay cut mark. Oh, yeah. Um, execution. Okay, how do we execute on this? That was the scheme. Hey, know your eligibles. We always got to know our eligibles. No matter, the, no matter the system, we always got to know our eligibles. We got to know our snapper and punter tendencies, including launch point. We won't have a lot of clips, and this isn't the intent, but uh, UFC is a really good punter. I can tell you which direction he is punting before they even line up. He has a tendency. So now we just change our launch point as it relates to DeFonte. And if he's got his back foot back a little, he is launching from here. If he's got this, if he's parallel, he's launching here. We've got to attack our launch point. Just know our tendencies. We also have this notion of don't get blocked. See, I'm an offensive guy. So I like to draw pictures. Okay, you block that here, and we run this inside zone system. We you get, oh, why can't we run that? Oh, because that guy's not getting blocked. And we need that sort of concept of don't get blocked. Be an athlete. Don't get blocked. Final thing, and this is important, and you'll see this in the film, is the upbacks don't exist. The upbacks in a pressure concept do not exist. They are not in your psyche as an athlete who's crazy. Because if you treat them like they exist, you cannot get to the punter. Point being, if Coach Hall is the up back and Coach Becker is the punter, if I'm going at him and I start to do this, I can't get to Coach Becker. If I like, oh, I've got to give Coach Hall a move and get a friend and not getting there. I've got to treat him like he doesn't exist. He exists, but hopefully my buddy exists too. And one of us has to choose. If one of him has to choose. He has to choose one of us. Pretty sure you're still going to get there. Coach Becker's pretty slow. Okay. <laughs> 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 oh, you're punter. <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to flip to a few clips just so I can show some of this in action. There's not many. Okay, just some context. This is game one. Uh, we, you know, with that slide that I showed about the punt team is going to be our weapon. I also said we have a goal. I set the goal for the team since it was my first. Ah, hell. That's me. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we set a goal. We're going to block four punts this year. The players, no, we can't. Like, we haven't blocked a punt in years. How are we going to block four? Like, how about one? No, four. We're going to block four. We're going to get one for a touchdown. That's our goal. So, uh, yeah, I, I just look like a crazy dude. And so this is our. Uh, 
um, game one against UBC. The second punt, the first punt was uh, from the, from our 37 yard line, and it wasn't really you know block uh, time, so we thought it was fake. So this is our first real chance at this. So as you can, this is an inside twins concept, but it's a pressure concept. I'm okay showing pressure because these players aren't seasoned enough to say, okay, that's not a problem. I'm just going to do my assignment. It's like, oh, uh oh, when they come, I got to, I got to snap this right. Punter's worried because he sees dudes coming. Okay, so we got to go after it, and then it's got to be scoop and score. Remember, this is game one, punt return two of the season. We'll see it from the, the, the back end. Again, uh, is there... This is that twins concept, two, the shoulder to shoulder over the guard. These guys should be a little tighter over the guard. Um, and we weren't bringing the Mac early on. Okay, watch, ah, watch 32, do you see 32? Act like the up back doesn't exist. Okay, you gotta <coughs> act like the up back doesn't exist. And Jackson Ford should have scored. <laughs> okay, bad high school coach. <coughs> okay, next one. Just advance. Okay, Manitoba, Coach Carhut, who's, uh, who's the Man U U18 Manitoba coach, has nightmares about us too. Um, again, so this is fairly early in the season. Um, we're showing pressure. Get up, get in, score. It, it isn't rocket science. Their snapper and punter weren't bad. The punter's trying to you know, make it in the league. Um, so I'm going to, but it's just from the back, from the end zone. Again, we're showing pressure. This isn't a twins concept. It's just these inside guys just get to go. So just stop it. Oh, that's me. <laughs> yeah, can you go back? This is a new cowboy. This guy, he's our will. He's normally out here, but Josh White, you know, go where you want to go. Be an athlete. So he just gives a different look. Now, he's not the guy that gets there. Jackson Ford is. But it's, if I made Jackson Ford stand on the other side, he wasn't going to be an athlete here. Okay, here's what else goes on. This is a situation, let's see it from the end zone, Cam. Um, this is a situation where our players don't trust. <clears throat> like, you gotta treat these guys that they don't exist. So instead, we go wide, and we need to get to those. That's a missed opportunity. That, to me, is not, oh, so close. That's damn. That was another chance for us to block a punt that we didn't get done. Let's go again. The importance of this clip, though, was that this is early in the game. It was pressure. This is the guy I think has a shot at being a CFL player. We are now in his head. We are also in the snapper's head. Let's advance it. This clip goes quick. We're in the snapper's head now because pressure's coming. That's a block punt to me. We get the ball 35 yards behind the line of scrimmage. That's a block punt to me. Okay, let's go advance. Absolutely next punt. This is the next time they come out. Now they're in double tights, two by two. Oh shit, they're coming. This guy is only a long snapper for them. His dad's the long snapper on Twitter. Long snapper dad. I'm not making fun of that. 
<laughs> it's the importance of pressure. Sometimes when you don't block, and you should have, that's one thing, be wary of what it presents. It presents situation. These are not clips from 10 years. These are clips from last year. Okay, let's bounce on. Um, just sometimes partial blocks. Partial blocks make a difference. And Alberta is a really sound punt, uh, punt team. Bad snap, we got to get to those. We got it. That's where you flip a field. Now, that was like a 12 yard punt. We'll take that. Um, but you still, we have to get these. Next one. <coughs> okay, Manitoba again. On a really crappy night, last game of the year, Manitoba was trying to win to advance their, their, their playoff seeds. We have nothing to play for other than breaking the special teams coordinator's heart, which we like to do. Get a block. <coughs> Let's rewind it just a touch. <coughs> this 31 right here, stop it. This guy, Cordelin, he's fifth year player. Kind of fell below in the depth chart to young Jackson Ford, who's kind of beat him up. This guy was playing his last football game in his life, and he wasn't seeing a lot of time, but he's out here. I put him on the punt return team because I thought he'd give it his all. This is a hint, a chance to score a touchdown on his very last, his last play. Pick it up, scoot and score. Oh, 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 oh. Still a really good play. Get the ball on the 17, and Coach McConkey's happy because he can go score a touchdown. Again, just look at the pressure. This is just line up how you want, dudes. Just don't hit the snapper. And 32 is just a natural ball. Uh, baller and he can make a play. I think that's it. Any questions about it? I'll certainly take them at the break uh, too. At the break. Um, okay, I think we'll take a quick break so we change speakers, Scotty. Gotcha. Okay, thank you.